heard about him through catechism and Catholic school and First Communion. I didn't came to, I didn't come to know him until uh, tragedy of losing my my grandma, who was the only living of both of my parents. It was tough. It was hard. I felt lost, and it was through that that I learned. I felt more. I felt more compelled to learn more and feel more. I came to know the Lord when I was a young boy. I was probably six or seven years old, and I was at Sunday school, and I knew, I just knew that I needed Jesus, and I prayed to ask him into my heart, and I just knew I was saved at that moment. I came to know Christ mainly mainly through my, um, my uncle. I just moved to Hawaii, like from Guam, and then my uncle invited us to the church, and um, I didn't really know Christ that much until I went to the Zero Gravity Camp in 2012, I think, 11. And through the worships and the, the, the Bible studies he was doing, I got to know Christ even more. And now that he's in my life, I can do more things and I play sports. I was better, I was a better person than I was. Before. I came to know the Lord mostly through worship team when Jamie asked me to play and it was at Legacy where I got offered. Legacy is the high school camp and it was like one of the biggest things for me at church so far because it was my first year. I was only in 8th grade so I didn't know anybody but like everyone there was amazing. They were all friendly and really, really, really into God. Why we came to Christ? So, very dark time for me. My son got sick, he was diagnosed with cancer, and I just couldn't do it alone. And a friend invited me here, and from that day on, I knew that I needed God and Christ in my life to do this, because I couldn't do it alone. We couldn't do it alone. I was at the end of my wits already, and I was about to take my life. I was at, I was like this close from ending my life, but God would send someone to my house and he just wanted to hug me and tell me if this is the last time you're going to see me then he, he was there to tell me hello and give me that last hug and then as he left my house I sat on my bed crying and then I heard that voice say you know I love you and that's how I became to, I came to know Christ. So I came to know the Lord I was by invitation. Someone that had worked here on staff invited me, and um, for many years I refused to come up here. Um, but eventually I did. I did come up, and, and um, I guess because I was a not a, an unbeliever, that so, and that's probably why I didn't want to come up here. But um, as time went on, I, I came up. The band came to pick me up, and I went um, to the services, and not knowing what God had in store, um, well, I'm still here today. <laughs> Well, everybody has a story. Can we thank them all for sharing their stories? Just a little glimpse of what God is doing in their lives. Everybody has a story. You have a story. Your family members have a story. And sometimes we don't know what people are going through, and we treat people in a certain way, not even understanding their story. Or let's just say there's a coworker or someone you know that you don't get along with so well, or the, maybe the way they treat you, and you're, you both kind of like clash uh, personalities or whatever it is, but you don't know their story. I mean, what if you were to ask them one day, you know, so what's your story? You know, tell me about your story, your life story. I think we'd be surprised at what people would tell us. I think we'd be amazed at what God has done through people's lives as well as what people have gone through because every single person has a story. The Bible tells us that God is the God who changes, but he is a God who doesn't change. He remains the same. And that's what this series is about. It's allowing us to remember that even though we go through changes and although the methods that God uses to speak to us and, and to bring change in our lives, maybe that changes, that God never changes, it reminds us that we can always come back to him because he is foundational and he is a rock. And he is faithful because he never changes. Today, as we talk about our story, 
we're going to learn that our story really takes place in two ways. One is our story. The other is God's story. And in, this, in these two stories, we're going to find that it is really dependent on our perspective that's going to help us to understand the bigger picture or the, the entire story of our life to help us to progress through even the most difficult times. In your notes, in fact, you can take that out from your bulletins. In your notes, we've been using these two scriptures as our foundation scriptures for this series that we're going through. And the first one is Psalm chapter 102, verse 25 through 27. And we're going to read this together, both of these scriptures. The first one, Psalm 102. It's on your notes or up here on the screen. We're going to read it together. Loud, thunderous voice. Okay, you ready? Go. Long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear away out like an old clothing. You will charge them like a garment and discard them, but you are always the same. You will live forever. And then let's read Hebrews 13, 8 together. Ready? Go. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that tells us that Jesus never changes. He is the same. And I'm so glad that he, does, he doesn't change. I mean, if every day we had to shift because God changed, what kind of God would he be? We wouldn't even know how faithful he could be today because he changed. That's why I'm glad that God never changes. But we all have stories. Uh, we've, some of us have been on a 40-day uh, social media-free season uh, since February 22nd, and if you missed that message, you can go back and check it out on our uh, New Hope app or our YouTube channel, but that day was the day I started for myself a 40-day social media-free uh, season. I don't even know what day it is, but uh, I feel like I don't even need it anymore. Uh, it's been so good. Uh, part of it is when you look at someone's post, uh, Facebook or even Instagram, Everyone is trying to tell a story, even if it's snapshot stories of what is going on in their life at that moment, they're, they're trying to tell a story. In fact, there are apps that you can use to put a video together with all of the pictures that you have, and it wants to tell the story of 2015 or 2014. Now, when you do that and you watch it and put to music, it tells the story of your past year of all the pictures that you took. And it's interesting that the pictures that we take, even though we may not know it or we're not doing it on purpose, it's showing someone else a story. Some of our stories are about food. We're telling people the story of my meal, that this is where I'm at, this is what I'm eating, this is who I'm with. Some of us tell stories about our children. Look at how kolohe my children are. Look at what they're doing. You know how rascal they are. Some of you will take a picture of you and your family at a vacation or on vacation, and you're telling a story. Some of you have self-stories. So you take a picture of yourself, and that's your story. You're just telling someone, this is my story. It's all about me. I'm the main character in this story. But we all have a story to tell. And it doesn't matter who you're telling the story to, for some reason, we all want to tell a story. Isn't it true that when we're gathered together with family or friends, that when we're telling stories, we all chip in and we're listening to the stories? And if someone tells a story about a wound or a broken bone, you have a story about a wound or a broken bone. Someone tells a story about so-and-so that got hurt or injured, you have a story about so-and-so getting hurt or injured. You have a story about your children doing, you know, bad things, you have a story about your children doing bad things. And it's not that we want to outdo each other, it's just we love telling stories. We love sitting down and talking story. Our culture here in Hawaii is built on stories. At a young age, we're learning about stories. We tell bedtime stories to our children. Now, why is that? Why do we have this inside of us? Why is it always in our soul to be storytellers? Well, the Bible says we're made in the image of God. 
And God is the, is the master author of our lives. Doesn't the Bible say that? That he is the author and perfecter of our faith. In other words, God is putting together his story. And you and I are part of that story. You and I are part of God's story in, in the making. It's live. It's on the spot. And we don't know what's going to happen, but we know what's happening today and what has taken place. See, all of us can learn a few things. All of us can learn how we can persevere through even the most difficult seasons of our life when our story seems darkest. And we're going to look at three powerful ways in how we can persevere even when our stories don't look so good. See, it all depends on our perspective, doesn't it? You can have a, you can have a good perspective or you can have a bad perspective. You can have a, a dark season that you're going through. Someone else will look at it and say, that's not that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. You'll be okay. But you're in the middle of it, and you're thinking chaos. It's not going to work out. There's no way possible. Well, what's the difference? Perspective. Matthew talks about it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. And the Bible says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You know what the Bible is saying? It's not talking about light or a lamp physically. It's really talking about our perspective, your eye, that the way you see things, that the way you perceive things. We don't even see with our eyeball. We see with our brain. Our eyes bring in the image, and then the brain translates what it sees. And so our perspective really plays a big part in the story that is being written in our lives. We can have a great season or a bad season, but really our perspective is going to help us to understand how to persevere forward. The Bible tells us how good it is when we dwell together in unity. It's almost like all our stories can be connected. And your story and my story, as being a part of God's story, kind of makes all of us understand that we all go through the same stuff. In fact, the Bible tells us that. We, not, there's nothing new under the sun. We all go through the same things. So here's the first thing we can learn. If you're taking notes, number one, don't get discouraged by temporary setbacks. It can be permanent, if that's your perspective. But don't get discouraged by temporary setbacks. It can be temporary or it can be permanent. It's really up to you. You see, when you get a wound physically and you get a cut on your arm, your body automatically moves towards healing. That's where all the blood is going to go so that it can clot that wound so that it doesn't continue to bleed so the healing can take place. Well, in the same way, that should be true with our soul, that when there's a wound, a hurt, or something happens to us, we should move towards healing, not towards bitterness, not towards anger, because now it can become a permanent setback. It can become permanent in our hearts. We can be permanently angered or permanently bitter, or we can be permanently scarred by what has happened. But when the Bible says, no, 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 it's... It's your perspective that's going to make the difference. You're, you're, you're going to have to make that choice to say, wait a minute, it can be temporary or permanent. It's really up to me. I love how Pastor Wayne Cordero says that. He says, never make permanent decisions based on passing emotions. Our emotions are going to pass. It'll come and go. Or you can choose to keep it permanent. That's why for many people, if they're an angry person, they're not angry because of what happened today. They're angry because of what happened 30 years ago that they never moved towards healing with. They just stayed angry. And so something continues to trigger that. And so nowadays, when you're talking to each other and something triggers it, they're short-tempered. Well, they're, they're short-tempered not because of what you said, but because they never dealt with what happened years ago in their story. So they're still on that chapter of anger or that chapter of unforgiveness or that chapter of bitterness, and it's a long chapter. 
You can either make it permanent or you can make it temporary. It's really up to you. James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Wait a minute. That just doesn't click. So when troubles come our way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. It doesn't sound right because that's not how we live in the world. In the world, when, we, when troubles come our way, we go into problem-solving mode and we get mad or we become sad or we become angry and then we try and deal with it as best as possible. But the Bible says, hang on, just consider it an opportunity for great joy. Now, why is that? And here it is. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You see how the Bible tells us that even though problems come our way, hang on, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Yeah, but so-and-so passed away. I mean, that's a permanent uh, thing that happened. Yeah, but, it, but what happens in you is more important than what is happening to you. What is happening in you is more important than what is happening around you. Yeah, but the loved one passed on. Yeah, but you will see them again. That's what eternity is all about. We have eternal hope in the Lord. Yeah, but I just lost my job. Yeah, but there may be a better one. Yeah, but I don't have the finances to make things work out. Yeah, but God will provide. You see, it's our perspective. If our perspective is in the situation, then we're stuck. Then we make permanent decisions based on passing moments. But the Bible says consider it. Just, just consider it an opportunity for great joy. Just consider it. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. Yeah, you may not feel like it, but just consider it. Considering means there's a chance. There's an opportunity there. There's something there. Just consider. So in your mind, just think, okay, there's this major setback. What would it look like? For great joy to happen. What, what would it look like? Just consider the possibilities of great joy. And the Bible says you're going to begin to grow in faith. There's going to be an opportunity for great joy. 1 Peter uh, 4.19, it also kind of gives us a paradox here. It says, therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So suffer according to the will of God. The will of God. Suffer. That doesn't seem like it goes hand in hand. I thought God's will was everything goes smooth. I thought God's will was the family is doing well. I thought God's will was I'm going to have all the finances I need. I thought God's will was that my relationship would be strong. I thought our marriage was going to be better. I thought coming to Jesus would solve all my problems. Well, the Bible says those also who suffer according to the will of God, which tells us those who are in the will of God will suffer. So some of us, our perspective is, I'm suffering, I must not be in God's will. Some, you're suffering because of the results of sin. That's a totally different thing. But some of us, you are in the will of God, you are following God, and you're suffering for it. Well, I don't want to suffer according to the will of God. No, that's the best suffering you and I will ever experience. So what does it mean to suffer according to the will of God? Well, suffering according to the will of God says that I'm entrusting my soul to a faithful creator. That's what I'm doing. I'm entrusting my soul to a faithful creator, and I continue to do what is right. Yeah, but I'm suffering for doing what is right. I don't have the finances now. But are you doing what is right? Yes. Then keep doing what is right. Suffer by doing what is right because you're entrusting your soul to a faithful creator who is building your story. It's a temporary season. And God can make your relationship with him permanent. You suffer according to the will of God. Some of us, we're going to suffer. We want to suffer according to our will. I want to suffer according to my will. I want to pout. I want to complain. I want, I want to throw in the towel. I want to call it quits. That's my will. And God is saying, that's not suffering at all. That's just giving up. 
But if you suffer according to my will, you're going to entrust your soul to a faithful creator who is creating your story. He's very creative. Your story is still being creative, filled with suspense, action, drama, thrills, romance, comedy, horror. <laughs> it's all there. That's why we gravitate towards movies, don't you? Isn't it interesting that the movies we love the most, we relate to the most? The movie, now you're going through your mind, oh my goodness, I shouldn't like that movie. The, the stories that we love the most, the movies we love the most, are the movies we probably relate to the most. In fact, pro probably some of your favorite movies or even the sitcoms that you watch on TV, you can relate to one of the characters. Or you watch it and you say, oh, that's my mom, that's my dad, oh, that's my spouse, that's you, that's this person. You can relate to them. Why? Because we all love stories. And we all live our lives vicariously through movies and stories. Some of us through other people's stories like, or other people's lives. Like you're, you're a believer and you know you're not supposed to do certain things, but so-and-so is doing something that you're not supposed to do. And then you say, oh, yeah, I'm living my life through you. Like you. You can do those things. I'm living my life through you, vicariously through them. You want to tell that person off, but that person did, and you're like, I, I cannot do that because I'm a Christian. I can't tell them off, but you can. So I'm going to live my life through you. Go tell them off. You, you do that. And we do. We live our lives through stories and other people's lives, especially movies. There's a second thing, and this I think might shock some of us, but God wants to use your story. What? Yes, God wants to use your story. What about my story? Why would God want to use my story? Because your story is a part of his story. Yeah, but you don't know my life story. No, but God does. He wants to use your life story. All of us have a story to tell that glorifies God. We all do. No one's story better than the other, but God gives you an award for your story. All of us. I love how this one teacher said it. In the classroom, she said, all of you, my students, all begin with an A. And the students were shocked. What do you mean? Yeah, you all have an A. Really? Yep. Yeah, we all have an A. Yep. But you determine if you keep that A. Wait, how, how is that determined? Oh, when we take tests, when we study, it's going to be up to you if you're going to keep that A. It's like God says to all of us, I created you, you all have an A story. All of you, top-notch stories, award-winning stories. Now you determine if that story stays that way. And now many of us have skewed off of the story, we've written our own pages. But not only us, you know who else wants to write a story, a page of our life here and there? The devil. The enemy wants to come in and write a short story, just a little narrative of your life and kind of change some things that make, and, and you make a decision and then he says, okay, this is who you are. That's part of your story. So he's going to write it. He just wants to just steal a page from your life. He wants to kill the storyline that God has for you. He wants to destroy the happy ending. That's what he comes to do, to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life. That's why... Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. God is the author and perfecter of our faith. We all have a story that God is writing, and he's not done with us yet. We were at a, a condo uh, taking a vacation, and don't you just love it when tests come your way? Well, a test came my way, and it seems like in this season of my life, the tests that come my way has to do with my pride, humility, you know, all of those kinds of things. So I'm wondering, maybe, maybe I need that in my life right now. Well, we're in this condo, we're on the third floor, and we're checking out. This is the last day. I hear a knock on our door, or the doorbell or something, and so I walk to the door, and I check through the, the little uh, peak hole, and then I, I see a guy standing there, kind of shorter gentleman, and just dressed in a regular T-shirt and shorts. And so I'm thinking, oh, maybe he has the wrong room. So I opened the door. I said, yes, can I help you? And he says, oh, uh, just wondering, uh, like, are there, like, people running around up here? And I'm there with my, my 
uh, children and my grandchildren. So my grandchildren are, you know, running amok. They're, they're on vacation, so ah! They do that normally. So I, I see him and I look back and my three grandchildren are looking at him. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, we have our grandkids here. And he goes, yeah, um, can they stop running? I'm like, brother, I've been trying to do that all day long. If you can try... <laughs> Besides NyQuil, no, we can't stop them from running. But I, I said, oh, I'm sorry. And he says, yeah, we're trying to sleep. I'm like, it's 10.30 in the morning. But he said we were traveling and, you know, we didn't get that much rest, so we were trying to rest. So that's, the, that's what's happening on the outside. Inside, oh, my goodness, inside, I'm having this conversation with God. I'm thinking, God, how can I, as best as possible, lick this guy but not sin. How can I, how can I like go to the, the closest possible to like telling this guy something but not dishonor you? What, what can I do, Lord, that like right on the edge of punching his face but not doing it? Like something, Lord. Can I, can I do something? And the Lord says, this is just a test of your pride. Can you humble yourself before this guy? <laughs> I'm like... No, but I can lay hands on him. I can, I can pray for him after, you know, the hit and then bring healing upon him and, oh, praise the Lord. Or, or the other option is just welcome him to Hawaii in, in a good way, you know. So I, I just asked him, I said, so, um, so where are you from? He said, oh, California. I said, oh, you've been traveling. He goes, yeah. I said, oh, okay, you know, we'll do our, be we will do our, we will do our best. Look at me, I'm all nuts already. You will do our best to keep it down and have the children not run and things like that so you can get your rest. He goes, oh, okay, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. I said, no, thank you for letting us know. Have your rest. Have a good day. Closed the door and I turned around and my family was there looking like, whoa, 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 we going? Or what are we going to do? What, what's, that, what's happening? <laughs> no, they weren't doing that. <laughs> Only Heidi was. <laughs> Joking, she wasn't. She didn't even know what was happening, but... When I was done with that, I, I kind of sensed the Lord saying, tests will come your way. It's not so you fail. It's so you pass. Because God is writing your story. And if I don't pass that test, guess what's going to happen? I'll be tested again and again and again and again until I pass that test. God only creates A students. That's why he wants us to pass. He doesn't see you as a B student or lower. He sees you as an A student. And he says it's an, it's an opportunity for great joy because I'm still writing your story. There are many people who are far from God who can learn from your story. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. See, the story that God is writing in our lives, the things that we go through, can help other people in this way. There are people far from God that they can't even relate to God right now. They're so far from Him, they're stuck in their sin or their past life, their, their behaviors or whatever it is in their life that they can't relate to God right now. They feel unworthy. They don't want to come close to God because they just feel dirty. And they can't relate to God because He's too powerful and too loving for them right now. So this is what God does. He uses you and I as his book to go into the world so others can read our life that they can relate to. And really what they're reading is not your life. They're reading the God in your life and what he has done. And so right now, the only God that can speak to them is our God through you. It's the God that you serve. 
It's Jesus who died for you that they can understand and relate to. So when you're telling your story, when you're living your story, when you're, when you're passing those tests, and they see that, they begin to glorify God. They're drawn closer to God because of your story. Everyone is gravitating towards some story. But the question is, are you going to let God use your story? My story is pretty simple. I grew up without a dad. He left us when I was seven years old. He died when I was in the 11th grade, right around the time Heidi and I had our first child. At about age 19 is when I came to know Jesus Christ. And when I came to know Jesus, it's like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. My sins were forgiven. My past was redeemed. My future looked hopeful. And I started to serve in the church. Got involved in the youth ministry. Loved every moment of it. And then continued to serve God today. And when I look at my life story, I could have called it quits many times. All, we, we all have quitting points. We all have times and opportunities in our lives that we can say, I'm done. I can't take it anymore. This is too much. I'm out of here. I'm done with you. I forget my family. Forget this. Forget that. And we're done. And it's almost like God is saying, I'm still writing your story because I want to use your story. It's powerful. I have certain key people in this world that only your life can touch. Only your life has a meaning in their life. Only your life can reach their life. It's one relationship at a time. And only you can give them hope. It's my hope through you to them. It doesn't happen without you. It's your story that I want to use because you are being written. It's your life story. And God says you're going to reach many people. You may not realize it, but God does. And he finds value in your story because he's writing it. Yeah, but I still have weeds in my life. You know, I, I, I planted some junk seeds back in my life, and so I'm still dealing with some consequences. Yeah, that's fine. God's not concerned about who you were. He's concerned about who you're becoming. Because once the fruit of God is in your life, now it's, you're going to start to bear fruit for him. And listen very carefully. In a field of oranges an orchard field or trees with oranges no one cares about the weeds anymore all they care about is the fruit and the nutrients that that fruit brings and the many more trees that can be birthed because of that one tree that one fruit and so it is with our life when you're bearing fruit for god you know your old life your past it's not going to matter anymore it's now going to bring glory to God because of what he has brought us from and where he is bringing us to. Never forget that God never wastes a dark season. He never wastes a life that looked bad. Because here's the third thing. My story is still being written. Your story is still being written. It's plain and simple. And although God's story is bigger than our story, it is still being written. No matter where you are in life, every single day is a new page that God is continuously writing and writing and writing. Some days you will throw in the towel or feel like throwing in the towel. Some days you will use that towel to wipe the sweat off your brow and keep going. And God wants to turn a difficult season into a successful one by turning your quitting points into opportunities to learn that you're entrusting your soul to a faithful creator that he can still finish your story strong but you're entrusting your soul your soul to a faithful creator and he's going to see it to the very end when you see it as a quitting point god sees it as our opportunity to learn look at how psalm 112 says it psalm 112 verses 1 through 4 it says praise the lord how joyful are those who fear the lord and delight in obeying his commands their children will be successful everywhere an entire generation of godly people will be blessed they themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever light shines in the darkness for the godly they are generous compassionate and righteous 
wait a minute. So when the Bible says light shines in the darkness for the godly, that tells me that even the godly will go through dark times. But here's the difference. For those who choose to live godly and discipline themselves for godly purposes, those are the ones that God still shines light even in the most difficult times. Even when you want to throw in the towel, God says, nope, still going to shine my light on you. Why? Because you're living for me. You still have a heart for me. You're still pursuing me. Oh, you didn't give up. You didn't give up on me. You still persevered through it. I'm going to shine my light on you even though you're in a dark season. Your children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed because your story is still being written. Your children will see your story. You may not be able to tell your story because they're young, but they're watching a live movie in your life. More is caught than taught. So they're going to watch every moment. Your children will be blessed. Philippians 1.6, it says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, your story is a part of his story because his life was given for yours. That's why Jesus died on the cross. It was at the cross that the devil thought he won, and he thought, well, I'm rewriting the story of history. And that was Friday. And then Sunday came, and Jesus rose from the grave. It's like the devil looked at his pages and said, wait a minute, this is not how it's supposed to go. And God still was writing. He still penned the words of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And somewhere along the line of this story, you keep turning the pages, turning the pages, 2,000 plus years later, there's your name written in his story. That when we get to heaven, we're going to turn to the book of life. We're going to see our name in it. We're going to say, that's, that's my story. I was a part of his story. Oh, it's happening today. And some of us think that even though we go through a dark season and we don't know what's happening, that it's done. No, your story is still being written. I want to read us a story I love how this story goes. It's called The Three Trees, and some of you might have heard it before. And it goes like this. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. Well, the first little tree looked up at the stars and said, I want to hold treasure. I, I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I'll be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. Well, the second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. Oh, I, I want to be traveling mighty waters and, and carrying powerful kings. I'll be the strongest ship in the world. Well, the third little tree looked down on the valley below where busy men and women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave the mountaintop at all. I want to grow so tall that when people stop and look at me, they'll raise their eyes to heaven and give glory to God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Well, years passed. The rain came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. And the first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It'll be perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining axe, the first tree fell. Well, now I shall make a beautiful chest. I shall hold wonderful treasure, the first tree said. Well, the second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It's perfect for me. And with one swoop of his shining axe, the second tree fell. Well, now I shall sell mighty waters, thought the second tree. I, I shall be a strong ship for mighty kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter didn't even look at her. He stood straight and tall and pointed. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven, but the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought her to a carpenter's shop. But the carpenter fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. 
the once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or treasure. In fact, she was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took her to a shipyard. But no mighty sailing ship was made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. She was too small and too weak to sail in an ocean or even a river. Instead, she was taken to a little lake. Well, the third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted was to stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Well, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams, but one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, said Mary to Joseph. And suddenly the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in all the world. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hand to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel, but on Sunday morning when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the third tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. And that was better than being the tallest tree in the world. Well, the second tree, the second tree was wondering, what am I to be? Found himself in a, found herself in a, a storm, a raging storm, when the man was fast asleep down below, the others gathered him. And the man came up, stretched out his hand and said, Peace, be still. And it was at that point where this little fishing boat knew that it was carrying the king of all kings that was greater than any other king she would ever dream of. The next time you feel discouraged because your life story is not turning out how you want it to turn out, just always remember that God's story is greater than our story because his life was given for your life. And God brings in the greatest change of all. Let him write your story. It's the best story you will ever tell. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for showing us not just a perspective to look from, but you, you show us that we're still living out a story our life story, that you're the author and perfecter of our faith. You're the one who has redeemed us. You give us a brand new page every single day, and I pray that we would remember to be people who don't get discouraged by temporary setbacks, and we don't make permanent decisions based on those passing emotions, but that we continue to look forward to the pages ahead. May we be people who understand that even though we go through dark seasons, that you want to use our story to touch a life somewhere, that people are looking for you, and maybe our story will grip them so much that they will understand your love even that much clearer because they can relate to us. Give us that perspective, Lord, that allows us to remember that our story is still being written. You're, you're still writing it. 
I pray for all of us today. As we start this day anew with a brand new page, we will let you continue to write the words to our story that is a part of your story, the God of change. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all said amen. Can we thank our author of our life story?